God richly bless you tonight. I want to greet you in the most exalted name, the name of Jesus. Praise God. Truly, there is none like him. There's none to be compared to him. When we think about the fact that we are alive and we are well, we think about the fact that God has spared our lives. Amen. It's a lot to give God thanks for. I mean, the Bible says that in everything we must give thanks for. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So we are grateful that God has given us the privilege one more time, amen, to be in another Bible study session. Tonight, let us just bow our heads as we get into, before we get into the session. Great God, we thank you again for your love, your mercy, your loving kindness, which is better than life. We thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have one more time to be in another Bible study session. Oh God, as we are about to get into your word, I pray right now, Holy Ghost, that you will take full control of whatever is said tonight. I pray, God, that you will functionize me. I pray, God, that you will touch my mind and my tongue. Help me, Lord, give me, Lord, a fluency of speech. Help me, Lord Jesus, to speak with clarity. And I pray, God, that for every person who will hear the word of God tonight, oh God, that it will not just be hearers, but whatever is said tonight will touch somebody's life, that somebody will be blessed, that someone will learn, that someone will grow. We thank you, Holy Ghost, that you afford us life and breath and afford us all that we need. You said in your words that you will never leave us comfortless, but that you will come to us. So we thank you, God, that you are with us one more time. God, as we are about to get into your word tonight, I pray, God, that you'll touch my mind, touch my heart, touch my spirit. I pray, God, God, if there's anything, any hindering spirit, any hindering thought that you'll remove from my mind even now, and let God, the words that come from my mouth, come directly from your throne. Touch somebody. Touch every person that's about to take part in this Bible study session. And for those who will watch it later on, touch them also. Above all, is God be in our midst. For we two or three are gathered together, touching anything concerning you, you are in the midst. So be in our midst tonight and bless us as we look to you in the most exalted name, the holy name, the great name, the name of Jesus, the greatest name, the name of Jesus. We thank you, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you again for tuning in to Bible study one more night. Amen. As we get into the word, I pray God that we will learn something. And I'm very excited tonight about the topic. This is this is one of my heartbeats. This is something that I, I think about all the time in relation to the word of God. Praise God. And the word of God plays a very important part in our lives. Amen. We want to realize that it is our guiding light. It's our, it's our, it's our source. It plays, it's our nourishment. Amen. It's everything that we need. And tonight, as we get into the word of God, we're going to see truly what the power of the word is. Praise God. So stay tuned tonight and make your notes. Praise God. As we delve into the topic, the power of the word. Praise God. The power of the word. Now, tonight I want us to understand that the word of God is a very powerful tool. The word of God is a very powerful tool. Actually, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. The word of God. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. Praise God. Now, tonight, I want us to understand that the Bible that we use, it stands as the most widely circulated and cherished book. Amen. Everywhere you go, amen, any country you go, there is a Bible there. I have been to hotels. I've been to different places. And there is always a Bible present somewhere. What we get to understand is that the Bible is so powerful the Bible is so 
much that it transcends culture, meaning that there has been many cultures that have been from the time of writing, even to now. When, when, when Moses did his first writing in the book of Genesis, there was a culture there. But yet still we have other writers, I mean, persons who wrote the time of the judges. We're talking about a different time period. And then you have the prophets who came along. We're talking about a different time period. It transcends cultures, so many different types of cultures. You have the Jewish culture of the Old Testament. Uh, then it moves into, you have different periods of time, different kings have come along the time, world kings, men like Nebuchadnezzar, men like Artaxerxes and all of these, Alexander the Great, all of these things, the Bible transcends and, and, and go beyond them. Amen. By the time we come into the New Testament, we're talking about the Roman culture, the Greco-Roman type of society, and all of this is covered in the Bible. It transcends languages because the Bible is translated in over 3,000 languages. And because of this, it makes it one of the most translated books in history. Praise God. Uh, praise God. The Bible is available in so many languages and dialects around the world. And not only that, what we realize of the Bible, it has it is translated using different forms. So you have Bibles that are translated using what we call a literal word-for-word -word rendering from the original language to either the English or the Latin or whatever it's translated to. Uh, the, the, the theological term for that, we call that the formal equivalence. But the Bible covers that. And then it goes to the other spectrum. Then you have books that go uh, like the NIV version, which takes what we call dynamic equivalence, which takes into consideration the thought of present time. And then you have paraphrase books like the message and so on. But it shows us how important the word of God is. It does only transcend cultures and languages. It transcends generations. Amen. Many generations have passed. When you, when you look in history, you talk about Christians who have been reading the word. I grew up hearing my grandmother talking about the Bible. My mother spoke about the Bible. Praise God. In this generation, there is still talks about the Bible. Now, because the Bible has been circulated for so many centuries, it is said that it has sold over bill it has sold billions of copies worldwide. No other book covers that reach. And because of that, it makes the Bible the most, the best seller book in history. That's the Bible that we have. The Bible has so much profound impact on civilization. It has it's affected civilization from every aspect of the world. It has influenced art. Some of the greatest art piece in the world is being influenced by the Bible. It has affected literature, law, ethics over centuries. I mean, it, 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 has, it, 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 it has helped to shape our society, the values and the norms I mean, that, that many countries follow is based on what is in the book. You're talking about influence. You're talking about distribution. We said that it has about 3,000 languages. We're talking about religious significance because many people, either if they are Christian or not, they will quote from the Bible at some point. Amen. And it, it, it shows us the power of the book. The Bible is the word of God. I, I had an encounter with somebody because what the devil is trying to do is to not have us as Christian value the true power of the word. Amen. I was having a conversation and the person said to me, look here, like the person quoted something and I said, look here, that is contradictory to the Bible. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that. And the person said, boy, you, you will can't kind of listen to you because everything for you is Bible. You, 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 it's like you don't allow people to live their lives. Everything about you is the Bible, is the Bible. What they don't understand is that the Bible affects every era of our lives. And if we should follow the word of God, then we would have a much better society. And the devil knows this, and therefore he has tried over the years to attack the word in multiple ways. He has attacked the word of God. So throughout history, many have tried to hide the Bible or destroy the Bible, and they do it for political reasons or for religious reasons or whatever the reason is. But what we realize is that despite the efforts 
praise God, despite the fact that people are persistent and they try to be, they, they, they try to, 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 to get rid of the Bible, as it were, the Bible still thrives. And it becomes one of the most widely read and influential book in all of history, in all the world. It's unbreakable and it triumphs over persecution. I can tell you that a lot of people over in history have attacked the word of God. But what they come to realize is that even though they attack this, because it's not a normal book, it's super, it's supernatural. It is the word of the infinite God. It's the word of the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent God. And, and therefore, because it is the word of God, God, it stands the test of time. Amen. Things have come, a lot of other things have risen and have fallen. But when it comes on to the word of God, from the writing of Moses in the, in, in the, in the beginning of time, and right to where John wrote, and John span right to the end of the ages, right to the end of time, the Bible has covered that. And irrespective of the persecution that will come and that has come, the Bible has stand the test of time. You have some few things that have come against the word of God. For example, you have a guy by the name of Diocletian. Amen. And he was a Roman emperor. And he, he lost one of the most severe persecution against the Christian church. Amen. It is said that of all the Roman empires, emperors that have risen, amen, the, the one that came the most against the church was Diocletian. It is known. Amen. Um, he had he did some serious persecution. Many Christians were killed. Many people were, were cut in half and, and their heads got cut off or whatever the case is because of this man. And as a part of his effort to ensure that he suppressed Christianity, amen, the man ordered the destruction of every Christian scripture talking everything, every writing, and that included the Bible. However, what we realize is that the mission of the Ecclesian failed. Amen. It failed. And Christianity continued to spread and to thrive. Amen. So even though he did everything that he did, at the end of the day, he realized in trying to, to, to get rid of the word of God, it failed. The emperor that came after him realized that, look here, you know, make no sense, but try. So he tried to join. The devil said, look here, all right, we can't attack from the outside. Let me attack from the inside. Because the emperor after him was constant time. And he changed a lot of things. But at the end of the day, the word of God remained. We talk about the French Revolution, which came about in the late 18th century. And during the French Revolution, the leaders of that time, they sought to eradicate or to get rid of Christianity and to replace it with a secular state religion. Amen. And as a part of their effort, what they did, they suppressed the Bible and any other religious texts. They closed church and they persecuted men who were, who were clergymen. However, again, the mission failed because their effort to eliminate the word of God. Amen did not happen because as we know it, the word of God is still alive and well today. They talk about the communist regime in the 20th century. So in various regimes, such as in the Soviet Union or in China, you have been many efforts to eradicate religious texts. Amen. And, and when I talk about religious texts, I talk about Christianity at their foremost. They try to suppress the Bible. In these countries, churches again are closed. Men who preach the gospel are persecuted. Amen. And guess what? Some in, in, in places like this, this people have to worship underground. Underground, but guess what happened, Virgin? Underground churches continue to operate, and believers secretly circulate copies of the Bible. Um, and guess what? At the end of the day, it shows us that the word of God is going to survive all the persecutions that come. Anything that the enemy comes with, because the word of God is not man-made, the word of God is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. It will stand the test of time. Outside of the fact that history says this, you have famous men also over history who have said things 
And again, they were proven wrong. So, for example, there's a guy by the name of Voltaire, and he lived from 1694 to 1778. And he predicted that the Bible would be extinct within a hundred years of his death. Amen. He said, even if a Bible should exist after he dies, it would only be in a museum. Because at after he said, within 25 years of him being dead, he said the Bible would be like a dead book. Only museums alone will have this particular book. But I'm here to tell Voltaire that you were wrong. Because he died in 1778. And 25 years after his death, the British and the Foreign Bible Society was organized. Uh, they, they organized that, look here, we're going to print Bibles. And guess what? They print Bibles at the same printry that was used to print the works of Voltaire. Actually, since his death, Billions of copies of the Bibles have been printed. So the demand for Bible after Voltaire's death only increased. The Bible lives on because it is the word of God. While Voltaire died and even his writings, praise God, to this day, it does not even reach an English version. Most of us don't even know who Voltaire is, but he predicted, thinking who he is, that in a hundred years, the Bible will be a forgotten book. No, Voltaire, you were wrong. The word of God will stand the test of time. We're talking about the power of the word. Not only that, there was a woman in Jamaica, Christine Hewitt. She was a journalist and an entertainer. And she said the Bible, the word of God, was the worst book ever written. You have to be careful, brothers and sisters, how you speak against the things of God. You have to be careful, brothers and sisters, how you speak against the word of God. Amen. Because what we realize is that in June 2006, she was found burnt beyond recognition in her motor vehicle. What am I saying, Virgin? That the word of God still stands irrespective of what people say. And that's happened because the Bible is the written word of the one true and living God. The Holy Bible is the written word of the one true and living God. Amen. There is power, brothers and sisters, in the word of God. Amen. And guess what will happen now? Because there is power in the word, you will never receive the fullness of God's power until you experience the power of his word. That is why most of us, we, we will do a lot of things. We will come to church. We will do this. But guess what? The enemy would want to keep us from being in the book because he knows that the transformative power, praise God, only comes uh, through us having a relationship with the word. Amen. Can I tell you something, brethren? Some of us, praise God, it's not that any of us are so good. But guess what? Once you get into the word of God, it's like putting water to the root of a tree. Amen. What you get into the word of God is like applying fertilizer to that tree. Praise God. Because what you're doing, praise God, it allows you to grow. And the enemy knows this. But I'm here to remind you tonight that there is power. There is power to change your life. There is power for us to move from, 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 from power to power, from stage to stage. Amen. In the kingdom of God, by the being in the word of God. I want to remind us of a few things that we spoke about in the in the past couple of weeks. Last couple of weeks, we talk about the consequences of sin. I would talk about the persecution of the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When we look at the, 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 the consequences of sin, we look at the fact that, amen, the actual sin means to miss the mark. Praise God. And we look at the fact that when we talk about the mark there, we're talking about the, 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 what the word of God says. And therefore, there is a consequence when we sin, but we only sin when we miss the moral standard mark that God has set up. Then we looked at last week the fact. So what we define sin as an any action or thought or attitude that violates God's moral laws. Praise God. 
and are falling short of God's perfect standard. That's what we spoke about what, two weeks ago. The truth be told is that in the Bible, uh, what sin is, sin is actually us going contrary to what the word of God actually teaches. Sin is us going contrary to what the perfect standard of the living God. We were also reminded and learned from the last lesson about the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we realized that Jesus did something. Praise God. He, when, when Satan came to him and he said, turn stone into bread, Jesus would stood him with using the word. And it's not a case where Jesus could not turn stone into bread because in St. John chapter 2, we learned how Jesus turned water into wine. So he surely could have turned stone into bread. But to do this situation, would have, he would have been acting independently of God and he needs power for his own personal benefit. So they offered him to, to go contrary to what the enemy has come with. He used the word. We're talking about the power of the word. When Satan tried to, get, to tell him to cast himself down from the top of the temple to demonstrate his power, and he even misapplied scriptures to persuade him that what he was doing was okay. Again, we see Jesus using the word. And in the third encounter, Satan tempted him to, to appeal to worldly power. And again, we see Jesus using the word. We're talking about the power of the word. Jesus uh, quoted scripture in every encounter. Jesus met the challenges with the word of God. And that's what we're talking about. No, we're talking about the power of God's word. If I'm going to come against sin, if we're going to be overcomers when temptation comes, what we're going to have to understand, brothers and sisters, is the power of the word of God. You must understand where the word of God is applicable to the immediate situations that we are in. Praise God. Because the enemy would want us to think that, look, at the end of the day, the word of God is this, this ancient book. But can I tell you, the word of God, as I said before, is quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is, 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 is applicable to your yesterday. It's applicable to your today and it's applicable to your tomorrow. The word of God and what Jesus did when the enemy came, he used the word and he made it applicable to his immediate situation. Situations will come, but there is power in the word of God. Now for the next few weeks, I want us to look at the power of the word from different angles. We're going to try to, for the next uh, four weeks, so four, five weeks if we conclude tonight, we'll be looking at the power of the word from different viewpoints. We're looking at an introduction tonight with relation to the power of God's word. We're going to look at how to study the word of God because what we're going to realize is that a lot of people open their Bibles, but they really don't know how to do any form of study. So one week, which is next week, how do I study this powerful word? Then apart from that, we're going to look at it from an apologetic perspective. How do I defend this word? Amen. You're going to realize that the word of God, praise God, is accurate when it comes out to things like archaeology. It's accurate when it comes out to things like history. Amen. It is accurate when it comes out to things like science. Praise God. You're going to realize that the, the, the word of God is so accurate that you can you can you can take it to the bank. Amen. To show you how, how sure we are. So we're going to look at the power of the word from a point of view of how to defend it. Amen. So when we have studied it, we learned how to defend it. We're going to look at how to apply the word of God to our daily lives. Praise God. So we're looking at now that I study this, I want now to apply this because that's where the power comes in. Amen. Not just being a hearer, the Bible says, but a doer of the word. How do I apply the word? And then when we have done all of that, for the last, we're going to look at the transformative power of the word of God. We're going to look at how the word of God can change your life. Amen. Change every aspect of your life. Every single thing, every single thing about your life can be changed through the word of God because it has power to change you. It has power to give you life. Jesus put it his way. The word that I speak unto you, he said they are spirit. And they are life. So for the next 
five weeks, if you include this week, we'll be covering the topic, the power of the word. We have already looked at the consequence of sin. Sin separates us from God. We look at how Jesus dealt with temptation. Amen. And now we're expanding on this because Jesus used something, amen, that gave him the edge over sin and even gave him the power, the victory, amen, over the temptation that came. Amen. And that is why we want to understand Clearly, the power, the transformative power, the how it's applied, how to defend it, how to study it. We want to get into the power of the word of Almighty God. Now, let's jump into this as we get into our introduction tonight. Now, the word of God, uh, when you look into the Bible and we talk about the word of God, there are two Greek words that the Bible used for the word of God. The first word is the word logos. And Logos, it refers to the total utterance of God. It is the complete revelation of what God has said. Amen. When we talk about everything from Genesis to Revelation, you're talking about the Logos, the complete revelation of what God has said. Everything that has to do with, with, with everything that God wants us to know. Amen. He has pointed it out in his word, amen, how to live, how to walk, what we want to know about God himself, praise God, he has revealed it, amen, in his word, praise God, so the logos is the complete revelation of what God has said, but there's another Greek word that is used in the Bible sometime for the word of God, and that's the rima, amen, and refers to a specific saying of God that applies to a special situation, Praise God. So when you put the two together, amen, the, the logos, amen, is the complete revelation, but the rima is the logos in action. The rima is the is the is the is the is the, is the actual uh power that comes out of the logos. God's complete revelation, and God wants you want to apply that situation to your life, you get into the rima, the spoken word. That is why, brothers and sisters, what we're going to realize is that a lot of people will say, okay, I don't need to listen to what pastor has to say. I don't need to listen to what the minister has to say. But what they don't realize is that there is a relationship between the Logos and the Rima. Amen. The Logos is the total revelation. But for you to get it into your uh, system, God has given us the Rima. And every now and then, he will give us, amen, somebody to speak a word to our situation. So we look at it this way, we get an example of how it's used. Amen. The Logos, for example, is used in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God, in other words, the entirety of the word is quick and is powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. So in this case, we're talking about the Logos, the complete revelation of the entire word of God. And the passage there is trying to highlight the, the penetrating and discerning power of God's word and is referring to the entire written word that that and the, the and the message that is conveys. So the entire written word, the entire word of God is penetrating, it's discerning, praise God. And that's what the word of God is. He's saying the entire book, the logos, which is used there, amen. So it's not a part of it, but the entirety of the book. From Genesis to Revelation, praise God, has a discerning power. It has a, a, it has a, a penetrating power that affects our lives. We all know Logos, which is used in St. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God. In other words, in the beginning was God had the entirety of his revelation. And that in that case, it talks about the thought, praise God, Logos, the thought, the, the plans of God. Amen. Everything, every plan that God had was in that. In the beginning was the plan, was the thought, was the was the expression of God. And the word was with God. But guess what? The word was God. So here, so the logos is used to refer to 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 to, to the entirety of God's plan. Amen. I know one of the Bible says, and the logos though became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is the logos. Then there's another word I said before that is used, the word rima. Amen. I will see that in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. It says, so then faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In this context, the word of God here is not logos, but the word of God here is rima. And it signifies the spoken message of Christ, uh, which is heard and believes. You can believe on it and it leads you into faith. Praise God. So 
the, in the context of Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we're not talking about the entirety of the revelation now. We're talking about the spoken message at a particular time. That is why when you come to church, one of the most important parts of the service is when the preacher brings the word. Because guess what? It's the it's the message of Christ. Amen. It's the it's the rima. Amen. It's the spoken word that gives that that that, that, that is that is given for a particular moment or need. The spoken word. It is it's so faith, the Bible says, come by hearing and hearing by the rima. Amen. Amen. by the, 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 the message that we hear and that we believe. Other verses that talk about the Rima is Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. You know, talking about the Rima, refer to the spoken word of God, indicating that spiritual substance or substance come from God's utterance and not just physical food. That is why when we come to the house of God, that is where our, our, our sustenance is going to come from. It's going to come from the spoken word that comes from the preacher. The spoken word will come from the man of God. Praise God. The spoken word, because that's it. So Rima refer to a specific spoken word or a word given for a particular situation. Amen. It, it, it is, it's more a personal message from God to me. It's a rima. It's a spoken word. So in summary, eh, both logos and rima are essential for understanding the full scope of God's communication with humanity. And both express his truth. But guess what? The logos is the universal word. It's, it's the entirety of God's revelation. While the rima is the spoken word, the word that is spoken for a particular situation or moment. Amen. God knows that, look here, when we come to church, we, when we say we come to church and we come for a word, it is the word of God. It is a subset. Amen. It's, 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 it's like God is, is, is giving us what we need. Our daily bread. Amen. God has given us what we need for today. Praise God. So sometimes some of us lack some things. And all of us lack some things. And God knows what we need and when we need it. Amen. And therefore, he will give you your tablet of love. Amen. Because you know you're lacking. He will give you your tablet of patience. Amen. He will give you. And that comes through the rima. Amen. We're talking about the power of the word. Now, one of the reasons why the word of God is so powerful is because of the source of where the word of God comes from. Amen. So the Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 11, the Lord gave the word. Amen. Great was the company of those that published it. Praise God. So the Lord gave the word. And this part emphasizes that the origin of the word is the Lord. It is not just human wisdom. It's not human philosophy. But the Lord gave the word. He's talking about divine revelation. And because it comes from God, what it does, it carries with it the authority and the power of God. It's like, it's like um, the boss saying to you, you need to get this thing done. Amen. And when sometimes when we are at the workplace and your boss speaks, praise God, the, is the, the power behind the person comes out. So people run and get things done because the boss said it. Can I tell somebody, when we talk about the word of God, the word of God is powerful because of who said it. The Lord gave the word. Amen. The Lord gave the word. And because the Lord, because it comes from God, it carries his authority. It carries his power and then guess what happened? because great was the company of those that publishes and this signifies the widespread dissemination of god's word by many faithful servants and it highlights how god's word once given is proclaimed and shared by multiple of people and it spreads its influence far and wide why because god gave his word when god speaks a word some people might not like it some people might not want to receive it Amen. For whatever the reasons are. But guess what? It comes with power. It comes with authority. I'm going to talk about this later on. We'll look at some things, what Jesus did. Amen. But the word is powerful because of its source. 
That is why the devil don't want us to get into the book. Some of us, we only take up our Bibles on a Sunday. Amen. And when we come to church, we probably just read part of it. Some of us don't even walk with our Bibles anymore. But guess what? We need to understand that the word, the word of God is the power of God. It's not human wisdom. It's not philosophy, but it's divine revelation from God himself. And because it comes from God, it has his power and it has his authority. Look at what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica. He said, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, in other words, Paul was the one who went to the to Thessalonica and he was declaring to them the word. He said, ye receive it. And guess what they received? He said, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually work it also in you that believe. So here it is that we can break this down a little bit. He said, for this cause also God, thank we God without ceasing. So Paul and his companion continuously was thanking God and their gratitude was ongoing. In the fact, uh, and this signified that the church at Thessalonica did something good. What did they do? They received the word of God, which they heard from them. So they received what Paul was saying to them. And they realized that the words that Paul was saying to them was not the words of men. So the, the church at Thessalonica did not treat the message as mere human opinion or teaching, which is what is happening nowadays. So people, people, if people would understand that when a person stands around the pulpit, I mean, and he, and he searches and he finds the mind of God to give a word, this is not mere human opinion or teaching. They recognize the church at Thessalonica that the words that came from Paul and his companion, practically his companions, were, were was, was recognized to have divine origin. I'm saying, as it is in truth, the word of God. And this they, they, they acknowledge that the message was truly from God himself. Amen. When we hear the word of God, and sometimes we have to be very careful because the word is given for exhortation, for comfort. Amen. And when we speak the word of God, we must realize that sometimes the word of God will come with a rebuke. Sometimes the word of God will come with, 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 with encouragement. Sometimes the word of God will come with exhortation. Sometimes the word of God will comfort us. But guess what? It is the word of God. Amen. So he's saying that, look here, the word of God will work in you that believe. You talk about effectually work it. And the Greek term here applies to active and powerful word. So the word of God is not static. When the Rima word comes, when the word of God comes to us, it is not static, but it is dynamic and it's transformative. In other words, it moves your life. It it, it shifts you. Amen. When we come, if, if we feel really, amen, take in what the word of God says, praise God, then eventually it will change our lives. We, we can't come this week and have, issues and then come next week i will still have the same issues all the time it means then that something is wrong but guess what what i realized is that he ended that particular statement by saying also in you that believe so the transformative power of the word of god is effective in those who do what believe we go back to what we said in romans faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rima the word of god amen so faith is the key that activates the working of God's word in a person's life. Let me say that again. Faith is the key that activates the working of God's word in a person's life. Amen. You know, and when you truly believe what the word of God says, when you truly understand and believe the power of the word of God, then that is what's going to activate God's working in your life. Amen. Uh, sometimes uh, some things don't happen, not because God don't want it to happen, but because we truly don't believe. And Paul said it here again, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. How are you receiving the messages? Amen. How are you receiving Bible studies? How are you receiving a simple prayer meeting word? Praise God. Is that you look at it, praise God, to say, this is just brother so-and-so speaking. And no, but the church of Thessalonica, praise God, they were smart because they received the word of God and they received the words that Paul spoke as the word of God. And because they believed, praise God, it was dynamic and it was transformative in their lives. 
again, I will say it again. Faith is the key that activates the working of God's word in a person's life. You can probably make note of that and write it down. Let me say it again so we don't miss it. Faith is the key that activates the working of God's word in your life. Amen. It will only become effective and transformative and dynamic and change you and shift you and your seat working when you believe. We're talking about the power of the word. Now, when you look at the word of God, there are some things that let us understand that the word of God is powerful. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 3 that through faith we understand. So here we see there's a link or a relationship between faith and the word. Amen. It's like the word of God is only active when faith is applied to it. And I'm talking in relation to the word of God in our lives. Because outside of us, the word of God will still run its course. But when it comes on to us, amen, it only becomes powerful in our lives when we truly believe it. Amen. And what we realize, as I was saying to my Sunday school class on Sunday, that faith, the Bible says in Hebrew 11, 6, that without faith is what? Impossible to please God. In other words, Words. It's like putting that key in that car and turning the ignition. If you sit in your car, it, it will move and go nowhere. But once you turn the ignition, what you have done, you have triggered something and it starts it up. That's what faith does. So we understand that there's a relationship, brothers and sisters, between the idea of faith, praise God, and the word of Almighty God. So through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, everything that happened in terms of creation started because of the word. We know that. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was not form and void. And that is what's upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Then here, here comes the word. Then God said, praise God. And that's what we understand. What, does, what is God saying? Praise God. And by faith, we understand this, that the worlds were framed. They were made by the word of Almighty God. So that the things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. They were not made by, by material, but they were made simply by the word of God. And the word of God has the power to call things into existence, uh, to, uh, to, to call things that never existed into place. Through the word, in a similar way, when the spoken word is placed over our lives, things that were amiss, amen, the word of God has a way of changing it. When David says, create in me a clean heart, oh God, amen, they use the same word. In other words, God has a way, when we have dirty heart and we have dirty ways, praise God, the word of God has a way of removing that dirty heart and putting us a clean heart, a new heart. But through faith, we understand that our lives can be shaped by the word of God. Not only did God speak things into being, but the Bible said, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33, 6. In other words, everything that we see in the earth and everything that we see in the heavens, everything that is visible and everything that is invisible was formed through the word of God. We don't see angels, but God spoke them. Amen. We, we, we were seeing trees and God spoke it. Praise God. It was the word of God which framed these things things so we understand that the word of god is powerful because it's it, it, it's through the word of god it has creative power it has the power to 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 change lives that's the power to dynamically shift things around amen uh and that's what we see we're talking about the power of god's word it was powerful enough to create the world and the heavens not only did the word of God do that, but I want to understand that everything that is existing today uh, continues to exist and is uphold by the power of God's word. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had made all things, when himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. We are seeing in the scripture that everything, everything that exists, not only was it called into being, but because the word of God state that it was continue, it continues. All things are uphold 
through the power of God's word. And why am I telling you these things? Because, you know, sometimes we are troubled with situations. We have, we have, we have sinful situations. We sometimes we miss the mark. We're going below the stand. Sometimes temptations will come and they will try to shift up. But there's some things we learn and we need, and there's some things we need to understand that there is a power that lies within the word of God that is able, brothers and sisters, to bring us from zero to a hundred, to able to make us into what he wants us to be. And therefore, everything, God not just call the heavens and the earth into being through his word, but God uphold all things that exist by the power of his word. What a word. Now you understand, when you, when you open your Bible and you read Psalm 23, it's not just a reading of Psalm 23. When you read the words of the Apostle Paul, or you read the, the life of Christ, or you read the book of Revelation, it's not just a reading. But what it is, it is the word of transformation. It is the word of power. It's the word that is quick and powerful and sharp and any two edges. So it's the word which made the devils tremble. It is the word of God. And you understand, it is powerful because of who spoke it. It is backed by Almighty God. So everything that came into being, came into being by the power of God's word. And everything that has been sustained, is been sustained by the power of God's word. The reason why you're on right now watching this session is because the word of God says that you should live. But God has already set a time for us. Amen. And some of us don't know when our time is. But irrespective, the word of God gives us another hope. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What am I saying? That everything is upheld by the power of God's word. Even the enemy themselves, they will cease to exist. The devil knows this. I, I, I'm, I'm still confused as to why he challenges God. Because he knows that it's the word of God why he still exists. It's the word of God why he's still around. But one word from the master and everything can be made right. One word. Quickly. Uh, one word that, that, that can be spoken can change your lives. The word of God. Now let's get into how do we use the power of God? How do we use the word of his power? Now I want us to understand that knowing there is power in the word of God is not enough. Because a lot of us come to church and we are fully aware we have a head knowledge that there is power in the word of God. But knowing it is not enough. For it to be effective, the word must be applied to your life as Jesus did. Say it again. Knowing there is power in the word of God is not enough. Coming to church and knowing some things is not enough. Uh, everything that has to do with the word of God, it goes beyond just a mental thing. It goes deeper than that. So knowing there's power in the word of God is not enough, brothers and sisters. You have to make the word of God effective and active in your life. And in order for us to do that, we must apply the word of God just as Jesus did. Now, let us look at Jesus, which is our ultimate example. When he came, he came to, to show us, as I said last week, how man should walk before God. He came not just to be God manifest in the flesh, but he came to be man, the second Adam, and how we should walk before the most holy and righteous God. So let us look at how we should use the word of power. The Bible says in Luke 4, 32, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Then he goes to say in Luke 4, 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what? A word is this, for with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they came out. In other words, Jesus was able to not just declare the word, but he used the word in such a way that people who looked on were astonished at his word. He spoke his word above that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were the lawmen and supposed to be the men of, of, of the scripture during that time. But his doctrine did not just come with mere words, but the word came with power. For I said, when we use the word of God, we need to understand that there is a power within it. And the power can only be activated when we believe it. So when I say devil, 
You need to get out of my life. When you say devil, you need to come out of my house. Praise God. And you're standing upon the authority of the word of God. You're standing upon the authority of the name of Jesus. Praise God. You are using the word. And, 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 and people will understand if you're getting crazy sometimes. But when you speak against situations, I mean, things have to back up. The Bible said they were amazed and speak among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commanded, he spoke a word, he gave a word to the unclean spirit and they came out. Tonight, there are some people on this line who have situation. I'm here to speak a word, to say, devil, you need to let loose, Haba, of God's people. I'm speaking a word with power and with authority. Amen. Because the word of God is quick and powerful. Amen. We need to understand that there is power in the word of God. Amen. And you, we need to understand as apostolics do. We don't just take lightly what the word of God says. When the Bible says he says his word and heal our disease. Amen? We're standing on the word of God. When the word of God says devils have to back up at the, at the mention of his name. Every knee shall bow of things in heaven. We declare the name of Jesus because the word of God says it. Power in the word. When Jesus spoke the word, a man with a withered hand was instantly healed. We sat in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. When Jesus spoke the word, the leper was instantly cleansed. We sat in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 to 3. I don't know what your situation is, but I wonder if you could, you could even right now think about the situation that you're going through and speak a word over it. There is power in the word. Some of us have been having a hard time and we understand, don't get me wrong, we are going to have situations, we're going to have troubles at times, we're going to have problems, but I can guarantee you that when you speak a word, the Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him. In other words, it's not that God removes the problem, but when you speak the word of God, the storm is there, but you're not bothered. You're like Jesus on that boat with your head on a pillow because you understand that the word of God comes with power and authority. Amen. Things might be going haywire around you, but you're walking in the word. And when you're walking in the word, you're walking in a place of peace. There might be some withered situation, some situation that, that seems as if it's dried up. But I wonder if we could just speak a word and allow God to heal that situation right now. There might be persons who are going through a leopard situation and leprosy in scripture represents sin. But we can speak a word and say, God, you promise that if I come to you with a heart of repentance, God, you promise to wash me and to cleanse me and to purge me. God, wash me with purge me with his up and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be white and speak a word over your situation. When Jesus spoke, he said, rise to the impotent man at the pool and some him. He said, see to the blind man and the man was able to see again. He said, come out and demons had to move. He said, hear and the deaf had to hear. He said, come forth and dead rise. Is there any person who wants to speak to our situation right now? Amen. Some of us need to rise from our state, our slumbered state, our state of depression, our state of, of being below the mark. Rise out of that. Some of us need to be able to start seeing some situations. I command the blind in the house. Persons who are not able, amen, praise God, to, to see what, 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 what is happening around them. See, we're telling some demonic forces to come out and take your flight. We're telling persons who are deaf to hear and persons who are dead to come forth because the word of God comes with power. And let me tell you something about the word of God. The word of God is so powerful. That it even works from a distance. You might say, Hello, how is it that you're speaking over this? You're not in front of me. But I remember in Matthew chapter 8, from verse 8 to verse 13, he says, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But he said, But speak the word only. I'm talking about the power of the word. I'm saying that the, the, the situation might be distance away. Amen. But there is so much power in the word. It moves and it moves faster than the speed of light. When you declare a word, amen, the person could be in China. When you speak a word over that situation, praise God, the word of God hit them like a lightning bolt. Praise God. He said, look here, God, and you, 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 
I, I, I'm not worthy to come under your roof, but speak the word, and my servant shall be healed. And verse 13 says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, again we see faith, so be it done unto thee, praise God, and his servant was healed in that self same hour. The man, the centurion, he believed in the power of God's word. He knew it was so powerful, it was not affected by time. It was not affected by place. There was no, there are uh, any other limitation that uh, uh, that man would want to put on it. The word of God is not limited, but it it is but to make it effective in his own life and situation, he had to claim that particular situation. He must apply the word of God to receive the benefits of his power. What am I saying? There are some stuff. Praise God. And you must understand that time can't stop the word. Please can't stop the word. No, 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 no limitation can stop the word. The only thing that can stop the word from working is you. But the word of God is powerful. That is why we need to read it. We need to read it. We need to read it so that it can, it can, it can, it can be the first thing that comes to our mind when situations come. When the devil wants to bombard us with problems and 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 tell you to do this and to do that, amen. The word of God must come forth, amen. And no matter where the force is coming from, when you speak the word of God, amen. No matter how far that devil is, the word of God is not affected by time. It's not affected by place. I'm going to, I'm speaking about somebody's situation right now. Somebody who believes that God, somebody who is struggling with something, somebody who is struggling with a sickness and don't believe and don't, and back you, God won't heal everybody, but God can heal some of us. Praise God. And I want us to know that all you need to do is just speak a word in this situation and watch the word of God, not being affected by how far you are, but be affected by how far that person is. Speak the word. And the Bible said, when Jesus spoke the word, that self same hour, the servant of the centurion was healed. How do we use the word of God? The first century church used God's word as power. Paul, when he was talking to the church at Corinth, he says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But he went on to say, but in demonstration, not, not what he was talking about, the speech and his preaching. In other words, he was talking about the rima. And so when I come up to talk to you, it might not be the most eloquent of speech. It might not be the best thing. It might not be as eloquent as Apollos was, because it's believed that Apollos was eloquent. I mean, he had a way probably of grabbing the crowd. I mean, a, 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 a stalwart from the school of Alexandria. I mean, he probably never had that. But he wanted the church of Corinth to understand that even though my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, hear what he's saying now, the power. But in demonstration of spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, he said that, look here, I come up and I preach. It's like the sister preach, and it, it might not be the best organized sermon. It might not be a sermon where it's okay, it's a three-point sermon, and it has this or that. But guess what? Because she's declaring the word of God, it comes with authority. It reaches our heart. We realize that this is God speaking and God will use you and your personality to declare. Guess what? It's not enticing words of man's wisdom, but demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When you open your Bible and you start going to your situation and say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You see yourself as a lamb and, and God as the, the shepherd taking care of you. You don't want, you don't lack anything. Amen. When you, when you get into the word of God and you realize that, that he, he, he will cover you, praise God, and he will protect you. Amen. And the name of the Lord is a strong and mighty toward the righteous run there and they are sick. When you start holding on to these things, amen, it might sound simple. Sometimes it even sound far-fetched based on what you're going through. But when you have faith, and it will stand in the wisdom of man. Man said, look, you're going dead tomorrow because I this you, but God said you will live and no man can kill you because you are wrapped up in the word of God. Now, what is our responsibility? What is our responsibility? Tonight, I want us to, to look at a few things as it relates to our responsibility in getting into the word of God. Our responsibility, because the word of God is so powerful, believers have a responsibility to make it known to the world. So we have a responsibility to each other. 
We have a responsibility to make it known to the world. Now, like the first century church, our responsibility looks like this. First of all, in order for us to truly make the word effective in our lives, the first thing we have to do is to study the word. And I'm going to talk about uh, how do I study it? But, you know, it's very important that we don't just become casual readers or we just read a verse and we leave it there. Virgin, take more interest. Not all of us are going to be Bible scholars. Not all of us are going to be um, persons who can, 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 can exegete all the time. But guess what? Make the effort to try to study. So Paul says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman and yet not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, you know, most times we read this verse, but we don't get into the context of the verse to understand why Paul was telling Timothy this. Now, this is Paul's second letter to Timothy. And it's one of the letters that we call a pastoral letter. And it was written while Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And it's given the background. And he, and, and he was about to face some form of persecution. Amen. So here it is that it, it, it was exhorting and instructing Timothy, who was Paul's young protege, as it were. And, 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 and Timothy was the leader or the pastor in the church at Ephesus. And Paul was encouraging Timothy to remain steadfast in the faith and to continue to preach the gospel despite the oppositions that will come and the persecutions. Now, I want you to understand that there were some things that were happening while Paul told uh, Timothy that he needs to study to show himself approved. And we're going to go more in this when we're going to study. But let us bring the, 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 the context of the verse. Because sometimes when we read the Bible, we just read that verse, but we don't read further on. If we read on top of verse 18, somewhere there, he mentions two persons, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And what these guys were doing they were, they, they, they were deviating from the, 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 the core of the Christian faith. You know, in recent times, I've seen where people have walked out and, and, they, have, and they, they have deviated so far from the truth. Here it is, a similar thing was happening. These two gentlemen, they, they, they came out of the Christian faith. But not only did they come out, they were teaching, uh, they, they were making some, some doctrinal teaching. They were, they were, they, their teaching was just, not just a minor error, if you look at it, but it, was, but it was a significant departure that affected other persons that were in the body. So Paul was saying to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. Now, what was the confusion that was happening? He was telling people that, look here, the resurrection has already passed. Now, what, 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 what does that mean? In other words, they were teaching some form of uh, Gnosticism. They were telling people that, look here, the, the, the fact that when they said the resurrection has passed, they were making the point that, look here, all right, there is no future resurrection. That's what they were saying. And, and Paul was saying to them, just avoid this, 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 this godless chatter. Avoid all them something. Study to show, Timothy, study and avoid them type of people here who are going against sound doctrine. He was telling Timothy that he must, he must ensure that he's in the word. Now, you might say, okay, how did that affect? How did this affect us as Christians today? To, to hear that, look here, um, the resurrection has already passed. This teaching, if you... It might seem simple, but what it did, it undermined the hope and the assurance of us as Christians. If, say, Paul never realized what was happening and telling Timothy, like, you need to study because these two gentlemen, amen, Herminius and Philetus, causing problems, then probably we would have had similar problems being passed on to this day. And we'd have believed that the, the resurrection, there's no resurrection for us. So it undermines the hope that we have. When I see it die, we, we, we cry because humanly we will cry because we know we won't see them for a while. 
But guess what? As a child of God, I always tell people that we don't sorrow as them that don't have no hope. When they say the resurrection has already passed, what they were saying is that, look here, the hope gone. It undermines the hope and the assurance of their believer regarding the future resurrection and eternal life that we have. So guess what? At the end of the day, Pastor, look here, in order for us to deal with false doctrine and false things that will come in, and trust me, in this season, more than ever, there is, there is so much false teaching. Sometimes it's hard even sometimes to decipher what is truth and what is error. But the only way we're able to do that is when we study diligently to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly. Which means that if, if you can rightly divide the word, it means that there be a case where you can do it wrong too. And that's what the devil does with Jesus. He quoted scripture and, and used scripture at, for, to, to, for his benefit. But it was contrary to what the word of God actually tells us. Brothers and sisters, I encourage us, our responsibility as we talk about the power of the word is for us to first study the word. And we're going to go more in depth in this, but I want us to understand at a high level that the word of God safeguards us against the attack of the enemy. When the Bible talks about the shield of faith, the shield of faith, but guess what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It goes all back to the power of the word. And when you can use the word in its correct way, amen, then you can... Shield off the enemy's deception. The enemy's undermining of what the true word of God says. Apart from the fact that we must study the word, our responsibility is to teach others about the word. He says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Amen. And Paul here is writing to the church at Galatia. Amen. And the letter address the problem of the Judaizers. Amen. And those who taught the Gentile Christians must follow the Mosaic law. And here it is that because of the issues, Paul was saying, if you have learned the true word of God, it's your responsibility now to communicate that to other people. Amen. Because guess what? He's going again against these Judaizers who emphasize that, look, you have to follow the laws of Moses. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So he said, let him that is taught in the word, Referring to those that who have instructed and, and have learned the word of God. Let them not just keep it to themselves, but let them pass it on, praise God, to each other. Amen. It's my responsibility that when a new convert comes in, amen, I discuss the word of God. You know, I remember back in the day when we used to come to church, there, there some of us as young men used to sit down and we would discuss things like the oneness of God. And we'll discuss things like baptism in Jesus' name. And everybody would go into the Bible and we are talking. Amen. And it, it was a way of passing the word of God. We are teaching each other. So those who learned it would have sat down and said, boy, and, and sometimes when they give us a revelation, it's, it's all news to them, but it's new to us and it's fresh. Praise God. And it's our responsibility to ensure that we don't miss it. So we study so that we can pass it on. We study it not so that I can be puffed up and see as if I know everything. No, I study the word of God so that we can pass it on. My life is not forever. I remember back in the day, um, we had people like a Pastor Grizzle or a, or, a, or a Pastor Dose and these men, they have passed, but guess what? What they have taught us has lived on and they were not selfish. Amen. I remember a teacher telling me in Bible school that any notes you have, don't be selfish with it. Pass it to somebody else. Don't, don't try to hug it up. Amen. Make sure it's your revelation. That's the worst thing that you can do. Praise God. What we need to do is to ensure that we pass on this because there is power in the word. Power to keep that generation. We don't want a generation to come up that don't know Christ. So responsibility number one, we need to study. Responsibility number two, we need to teach others. Responsibility number three, we need to preach the word. And when I talk about preaching the word, amen, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, it says preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. And it tell you why you must do it. You say you must reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Let me break this down to you. First of all, there are three words that jump out at me when you look at this. Apart from the Bible it says, preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. The Greek word there that, that talk about be instant it's the same word that means to be ready, to stand by, or to be persistent. Uh, it, it, it implies a state of preparedness and vigilance. And how often you must do this? In season and out of season. Meaning you must ready at every time, at all time. Whether it is convenient time or not. And here it is that Paul is saying to, to Timothy, 
that he must be diligent in his preaching and teaching regardless of the situation. But there are three words, in my opinion, that jump out at me. He said he must, be, he must reprove, he must rebuke, and he must exhort. That's what the word of God does. That is why we study. That is why we tell others. I mean, that's why we must be ready to declare the word for three reasons. First, we must rebuke. And a lot of, but we must reprove. Let me start with that. And the Greek word there is excel zan, means to correct or to convince. Nowadays, it's kind of difficult when you go to people and sometimes it's disheartened because of the hearts of people. We, have, we are now living in a time where uh, people don't like to be corrected. So it, it's kind of it's kind of ticklish position when you go to somebody and say, boy, you know that, I understand. Worse, I have to be careful who you're talking to. You're talking to a new convert, a newborn babe. You know, you have to be careful who you, you address them. But somebody who has been in the church a long time, and you come to church and your clothes is super tight, I mean, or, the, or your pants, you just look like the world. For your walking, your hair is not kept. And, and it's, it's, it's difficult. I say, boy, brother, this and this and this. And you, you use the word of God. Look here, you're supposed to stand out. You're supposed to look different than the world. You can't be like the world. And you, people are offended. But the word of God says we must reprove, mean to correct or to convince. Sometimes we have, well, that would have more like taste of rebuke. But reprove here means to correct or to convince. Sometimes there are doctrinal errors. There are, there, there are things that need to be corrected. And guess what? We use the word of God to deal with that. But we deal with the word of God also to rebuke means to sharply criticize and rip a man. I mean, there comes a time where the word of God have to be placed out there so persons understand that your situations demand this not all the time. I mean, sometimes God deal with you privately, but sometimes God deal with you publicly. I mean, so that others may fear. But guess what? There is a season also of exhort. Uh, which means to encourage or to comfort or to urge. That's what the word of God does. It's a threefold thing. It reproves, in other words, it corrects or it convinces. It rebukes, meaning it sharply criticizes a reprimand or it exhort, means encourage or to comfort. Or to, and this happens across the board. You think about your child at home. Amen. Sometimes you have to correct them. Sometimes you have to discipline them. And sometimes you have to, uh, you have to encourage them. And all of these things, come together to mold the child. Sometimes the molding sharper. Sometimes you're going to take this or that, but whatever it takes. And that's what the word of God does. It's our responsibility, every child of God, amen, to ensure that we study the word, to ensure that we pass it on to each other. But at the same time, that we preach and we teach it and we do it account as God has led us. Some word, every Sunday can be a word of exhortation. Sometimes there's a word of rebuke, amen. And sometimes there's a word of reproof. All of these are applicable to the body of Christ. And we do this all the time. The church should preach. Uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, that they were scattered about, went everywhere preaching the word. Amen. Acts chapter 12 verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And it's interesting. Let me just stop here. The word of God uh, grew and multiplied. And that's just talking about what happened with Peter, in Acts chapter 12, verse 24, he's talking about what happened with Peter, where Peter was miraculously escaping from prison. King Agrippa I had begun to persecute the church, and he was killing, and he killed James and the brother of John, and he imprisoned Peter, and his intention was to execute him. However, we know the scripture, an angel of the Lord rescued Peter from prison, and Herod's subsequent death, he was struck down by an angel of the Lord, and was eaten by worms because he did not give the glory to God. And this is recounted just before this verse. So despite Herod's effort to suppress the church, the word of God, notice now. So we see the context. Peter in prison, people were being persecuted. The man sat at the glory and, and God strike him down. And the angels strike him down and worm eat his body. And the word of God was preached. That's the word of God. So despite him trying to stop the word of God, the word of God continued to grow and multiply, showing that the power of God and the spread of gospel should not be hindered by persecution or opposition. That's the context. I wanted to bring that one there. In Acts chapter 13, verse 49, 49 says, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Again, there's a backstory behind this where Paul and Barnabas was on their first missionary journey. Acts chapter 13 is the first missionary journey. And they traveled to a place called Antioch in Pisidia which is what we call modern day Turkey, I think it is. And he preached in a synagogue. And there, the, the, the message that he preached came with some mixed reaction, praise God. And so, so the Gentiles received it with joy 
and believe, but some of the Jews opposed what he was saying and they incited persecution against Paul. And despite this opposition, praise God, the message of the gospel spread throughout the whole region. And this spread was uh, facilitated by the uh, enthusiastic response to the Gentiles who were overjoyed to be included in the promises of God, leading to a significant expansion of the early Christian movement in the Gentile world. What am I saying? And the word of God was published throughout all the region. Irrespective of what come, people are going to come against it. Some people that will accept it, but still preach it. Because guess what? Based on the fact that Paul preached, some never liked it, some did. But the word of God stand the test of time, and it was published throughout all region. Number four, our responsibility is not to be ashamed of the word of God. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he come in the glory of his father with his holy angels. Don't be afraid to let people understand that like this year, I follow the word of God and the word of God says I cannot lie and the word of God says I cannot do this or I cannot get involved in this or I need to come out and be separate. Sometimes People at work say, so why you don't do this? You, no, man, you must take a drink. Or you must want to come a party with some I'm say, no, the word, I, I follow what the word of God. The word of God is my guiding light. The word of God is what guides me and keeps me. And therefore, irrespective of what comes, I'm going to follow what the word of God says. Okay, some of us are ashamed of the word. And we know we are ashamed because when we are in the company of other people, we don't declare the word. When you love something, you talk about it. When you love somebody, you talk about them. And therefore, the word of God, we should not be ashamed of it. Number five and last, we must pass it to our children. We read this every time we do a baby communion, um, a baby communion, a baby dedication. It says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice God gave them, I will talk to Shema. Here is where the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might and with all thy strength. So here is that God gave them a word. But it was not just for them. He said, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. It's important that we diligently teach our children. Amen. We realize that we a lot of people are interested in them learning everything else. But when they come out of the word of God, we don't sit down. That's like how Paul Timothy talked about him learning from his grandmother. Amen. In a similar way, we have to ensure that we our responsibility is to teach them the word. Make sure that the word of God is in them. Make sure that they can know the scriptures. Make sure that they can quote the scriptures. And if they can learn physics and they can learn chemistry and they can learn this, then they can learn Acts 238 and they can learn uh, Lamentation and they can learn Genesis and they can learn the Psalms. They can learn too. Because we understand the power of the word of God, the disciples did the following. They say, they asked God for boldness to speak his word. That's what we need in this season. Boldness to speak the word of God. The Bible says in Acts 4, 29, And now the Lord, behold, their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. And when they had prayed, verse 31, the place was shaken, which they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word of God with boldness. We need to be able to speak the word of God with boldness. There's a boldness that comes with us understanding that this word backs us. The disciples knew that even they were while well, they were under persecution and they were threatening and things were happening, their prayer was that God give us the ability that in this season that I can speak the word because there is power in the word. And irrespective of what comes, the word of God is what is going to take the preeminence. The word of God increases throughout the world because of their faithfulness. They were faithful. They asked God to help them to speak the word. And they spoke the word with boldness. So Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. 
Acts chapter 19, verse 20, so mighty grew the word of God and prevailed. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Better yet, when we fulfill our responsibility, God will conform his word with signs. When we start to study, when we start to preach, when we start to pass it on, when we start to do all of these things, God is going to confirm the word of God with signs. One cannot wait for the signs to precede the word. Don't wait for signs to precede the word. Get into the word. And when they start getting to the word, I start declare the word. I start declare the word. I start declare the word. And you can expect signs to follow. God, that's the word of God. What the word of God teaches us. God bless you tonight. God bless you. God bless you. Next week, we're going to continue with this whole subject of the power of the word from a different perspective. But I want us to understand that for us to overcome sin, for us to, to, to be victorious when temptation comes, we need to get into the word because there is power in the word. God bless you as you bow your heads. Great God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you one more time for your word, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for your word, which changed lives, which is dynamic, which is able, Lord Jesus, to bring us from strength to strength in you. Thank you, Lord God, for what you have done tonight and what you have said. As we look to you, who is the author, the finisher of our faith, bless this house, bless every hearer tonight, and let your will be done. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.